welcome to the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. Wanted to do a brief overview of my 12-week online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Join me live in class Saturday, July 29th, 2023, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at our online school for another exciting, informative session of my 12-week online course. You see me on Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, talking about this class. You see me on Faraji Muhammad's show, The Culture. Uh, you see me on the Tammy Mac Lake show, uh, as well on the Fox Soul TV network. And this is a 12-week online course. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So you never look at history uh, the same way again. So in this 12-week online course that I developed and I put together the slideshow, the curriculum, I chose the content. Uh, we can't start studying our history in slavery, okay? Even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study, we can't start in 1619. And there's a whole lot of talk about 1619 uh, because of the 1619 project and, and the 400th year anniversary of August 20th, 1619, which we do deal with in the class, but we deal with thousands of years of history that leads up to 1619 as well. We can start in 1619 um, in, in Virginia or in the 1440s when the Portuguese get involved in the transatlantic slave trade. We have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who take the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa um, into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal in 711 AD. And it's going to be these teachings that are going to bring Europe out of the dark ages. OK, they bring Europe out of the dark ages. This course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but deals with thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Now, August 26, uh, 2019 marked the 400th year anniversary of those 20 and odd Africans or 20 and odd Negroes who came into Point Comfort which was really in Hampton, Virginia, as opposed to Jamestown, Virginia, on August 20, 1619, on the White Lion pirate ship. And we go in depth and talk about what happened and deal with the fact that you had 350 Africans who were taken from uh, Angola and, uh, on the, and they were on a slave ship called the San Juan Batista. And the San Juan Batista gets hijacked around Veracruz, Mexico, by two English pirate ships, two English pirate ships, the White Lion and the Treasurer, okay? Um, and it's going to be the White Lion and the Treasurer, they come into uh, uh, Virginia in uh, August of 1619, and those 29 Africans are gonna be on the White Lion pirate ship, L-I-O-N, which was an English pirate ship. Um, so the uh, August 20, 1619 marked the 400th year anniversary uh, of those 20 and odd Africans who came into Point Comfort on August 20, 1619, in what would later become uh, the, the colony of Virginia. Now, this was known as the year of return, as many African Americans were and continued to reconnect to Africa and travel to uh, Ghana or uh, other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central, and South America and have been in the land that we call the United States of America, or some called Turtle Island, at least 51,700 years. And we use uh, numerous sources uh, in this class. Uh, we look at a timeline of history, uh, the book references, their uh, 82,100 articles that we look at as well. We have video clips, uh, PowerPoint presentation, et cetera. Now we see that the teaching of African history has come under uh, attack and probably unprecedented attack um, in, in the last few years. We see the uh, in Florida, especially uh, the advanced placement African-American studies class uh, from the college board. We see that being banned uh, in the state of Florida. We saw protests take place um, around that. Uh, we see with the anti-critical race laws 
uh, uh, in the past uh, uh, two or three years, we see that impacting how Black History Month lessons are taught in schools. Uh, Axios.com had this article, new rules are limiting how teachers can teach uh, Black History Month. We see stories about uh, uh, slave, uh, we see stories about lessons dealing with slavery gone wrong, like this article from USA Today, mock slave auctions, racist lessons, how U.S. history class often traumatizes, dehumanizes black students. So we different, we see different stories like this in, in the latest um, attack dealing with the teaching of African-American history, once again, comes out of Florida in the new social studies standards. And part of the new social studies standards appear to teach middle school students that at least some uh, African-Americans benefited from slavery because it taught them useful skills, okay? As this article from NBC News uh, discusses, and we've dealt with this on the African History Network show uh, as well. So in this class, we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So the 1619 project, um, even though there is some good information in it, um, a a lot of what we know about those 20 and odd Africans is wrong. And uh, one of the problems with the 1619 project is it does not deal with the African presence uh, in the land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago, which we deal with in the class. And we uh, discussed Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, as well as other sources. But this article here from um, VirginiaMercury.com, much of what we've been told about Virginia 1619 first Africans is wrong. This is from August 11th, 2019. Now, this is a historical marker that is at uh, uh, Fort Monroe uh, in Virginia, and it notes the arrival of the first Africans uh, uh, in Virginia. And in 1619, codified slave laws don't exist in any of the 13 colonies. The first of the 13 colonies to have codified slave laws is Massachusetts in 1641. Okay, and these um, Africans are going to be in put, put into a form of indigenous servitude. And after about three to five years or so, they're going to be released from that. Um, the Washington Post has a good article that deals with uh, 93 years before 1619. It deals with the settlement that the Spanish tried to set up in the South Carolina, Georgia area. Uh, before 1619, there was 1526 the mystery of the first enslaved Africans and what became the United States. Uh, Spanish explorers brought 100 uh, African slaves to a doomed settlement in South Carolina or Georgia. Within weeks, the subjugated revolted, then vanished. Within weeks, the subjugated revolted, then vanished. Um, Be sure to register for this 12-week online course. You can do so at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com the African History Network.com. We have the information right in the thread of the broadcast also. Okay, so one of the sources that we use in the class is Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. He's a friend of mine. If you've been following the African History Network uh, and following my show, which has been on the air 13 years, you know, I've interviewed him um, thir- about 13 times actually. And this is his first book. His second book is out, The First Americans Were Africans, um, Revised and Expanded. So this first book is out of print, okay? But his second book is available uh, for purchase at Amazon.com. And his book deals with, um, his his book is backed by 713 footnotes and uh, seven peer-reviewed articles. And it documents an African presence in North, Central, and South America dating back at least 56,000 years ago, who, which would be the Khoisan, who have the oldest DNA on the planet. Um, page 14 of his book deals with a discovery made by Dr. Albert Goodyear in Allendale County, South Carolina uh, in 2004. Okay, And Dr. Albert Goodyear and his team found 13 different types of evidence that thoroughly document an African presence in this country dating back at least 
uh, 51,700 years ago, at least 51,700 years ago, okay? And these were the Khoisan, the short-statured Africans. Uh, so this is why even though 1619 is important to study, we get way, we get way too caught up in 1619, okay? Uh, African people were the first people uh, on the planet. We look at archaeological discoveries um, in this class that continue to push the timelines back, like the one that came out of Morocco in June 2017, which shows um, remains of Homo sapiens dating back uh, between 300,000 and 350,000 years ago, uh, which is uh, uh, at least 100,000 years older than the remains that were uh, found in Ethiopia. Uh, about 1974, they dated back 195,000 years ago. But in Allendale County, South Carolina, they found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints, and lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, uh, linguistics, painting, skull, skeleton, structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence that dates back at least 51,700 years ago. Now, here is a um, picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. Um, here is his, uh, this is an article that he wrote. I'm sorry, this is an article uh, about his discovery uh, at ScienceDaily.com. ScienceDaily.com is articles dealing with uh, scientific discoveries, archaeological discoveries. This is an article from November 18th, 2004. The article is still there. You can go read it yourself. It's called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. And uh, a summary of the article, and this is the summary coming from ScienceDaily.com, science not me. It says radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River. So that'd be May uh, 2004, last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archeologist, Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments uh, containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. So, so who are these humans? Okay. Well, an October, 2012 genetic study published in science magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan are formally called by the derogatory term Bushmen, and they are genetically unique and no other currently known population, uh, no other currently known population has separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Now, these are two uh, Khoisan uh, women here. These are the short statured Africans. Now the Khoisan live mainly in Southern Africa in territories spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, gatherers or, or the Sans people, S-A-N-S, and keepers of the livestock, also known as the Khoi Khoi people. Now, Sarah Bartman, Sarta J. Bartman, uh, who was who was derisively called Hottentot Venus, who was um, sold into uh, sideshows, freak shows in in uh, Europe, and traveled around in in the early 1800s. And she dies in 1815. Um, Sarah Bartman was was uh, Khoisan. Okay, the Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. And there was an article from atlantablackstar.com, five ethnic groups that proved the first humans were black that you could check out as well. Uh, and then we look at uh, different African civilizations and different ancient civilizations. And uh, one of them is, uh, uh, we look at Nubia, uh, 
Otanahesi, ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. We look at the uh, early mound builders, uh, and we look at the the Omex as well. Uh, and we look at excerpts from Dr. David M. Hotep's book. Uh, also, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. And uh, we know that there are about one million mounds that existed uh, in this land that we call uh, the United States of America. Uh, there were one million Indian mounds in North America. The data are only 100,000. Um, Cyrus Thomas, director of the Eastern Mound Division of the Smithsonian Institute Bureau of uh, Ethnology in 1881, said, quote, distinct from the American Indians, end quote. There was a race of mound builders in America distinct from the American Indians, okay? Um, and there are also large erections formerly called Native American mounds, now known to be African mounds that are shaped like pyramids that are found across North America. The largest ones surviving today are in the Mississippi Valley. The largest of all was uh, uh, the Cahokia Mound near uh, the area uh, where the Mississippi and Missouri rivers converge, okay? Now, so we go and look at different archeological uh, discoveries that are causing uh, the scientists and archeologists and paleontologists to rethink everything. One of those archeological discoveries uh, was revealed in June of 2017. Now, this is an article from uh, NBCnews.com and uh, the name of this article is we're older than we thought new find pushes human origin back 100,000 years ago uh, and this was a discovery made in morocco okay uh in morocco and they found um uh, remains of homo sapiens that date back at least 300,000 to 350,000 years ago Modern humans evolved much earlier than previously thought, researchers reported. New discoveries at a rich site in Morocco show modern humans were hunting and probably cooking game animals 300,000 years ago. This is 100,000 years earlier than scientists had believed uh, up until now. Now, new discoveries and new dating methods show that, in fact, many of the bones belonging to modern homo sapiens uh, uh, and, and, and uh, belonged to modern homo sapiens. And they lived as far back as 300,000, 350,000 years ago. Now the earliest previous homo sapiens uh, bones or modern man's uh, bones date back 195,000 years ago. And uh, they are found clear across the continent in modern day uh, Ethiopia. Taken together, the findings show modern humans were dispersed across Africa long before anyone ever thought. Okay, now that's from June 2017. This discovery here that was reported by the New York Times in their science section, this deals with stone tools found on the Greek island of Crete that date back um, about at least 130,000 years ago. On Crete, new evidence, new evidence of very ancient mariners on Crete new evidence of very ancient mariners. This is from the New York Times, February 15th, 2010. And uh, it said this discovery here is causing the scientists to rethink everything. And this discovery is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures, okay? Uh, so the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. So we go through and look at history chronologically and see what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, which begins in the early 1440s. Uh, we look at civilizations like ancient Nubia or ta -Nehisi, which dates back to about uh, 4,500 BCE before the common era of BC. Uh, ancient Nubia or ta -Seti, or, or also called ta -Nehisi. Uh, and that, that region uh, would be known as Kush, K-U-S-H, was a region along the Nile River located in northern Sudan and southern Egypt. So the lower portion of what is today Egypt and the upper portion of the Sudan is where Nubia was 
uh, in ancient times, okay? And we know that the geographical boundaries that make up the 54 African countries, uh, those geographical boundaries largely come from the, uh, are the result of the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, when um, 14 European nations meet in uh, Berlin, Germany, to carve up Africa into colonies, okay? And they draw the geographical boundaries around the areas that have the natural resources that the respective European nations want. Now, known for rich deposits of gold, Nubia was a uh, major trading port for luxury goods that came from sub-Saharan Africa, such as incense, ivory, and ebony. Uh, Nubia was home to some of Africa's earliest kingdoms. The first monarchy of, of recorded history was established in Nubia. The Nubians were also known for their exceptional archery skills that provided the military strength for their rulers. Kings of Nubia ultimately conquered and ruled Egypt for about 100 years, or about, a cent about one century. Monuments still stand in modern Egypt. Monuments still stand in modern Egypt and Sudan at the sites where Nubian rulers built cities temples and royal pyramids so nubia is the mother of ancient kemet ancient egypt and the grandmother of ancient kemet ancient egypt is ethiopia or abyssinia okay because civilization travels up the nile river now in the 1880s the western world's interest in nubia was awakened by the rediscovery of the ancient empire's monuments which were reported almost simultaneously by individual British, French, and American explorers. Many of them found it difficult. Many of these Europeans found it difficult to credit indigenous Africans for building such a civilization. And Nubia is one of these African civilizations that Europeans tried to claim as their own. And just like ancient Kim and ancient Egypt, and they tried to say that these were either brown skinned Caucasians or they were Medi people from the Mediterranean. They didn't want to say that these were black Africans. All right. Um, and we show you this video here of this white, uh, this European scientist who was disappointed when he finds out that the ancient Egyptian pharaohs were black Africans also. OK, now, during the 1840s, German Egyptologist Carl Richard Lepsius asserted confidently that the Greek term Ethiopian, uh, when referring to, to the ancient civilized people of Kush, did not apply to Negroes. He said the ancient, uh, the, the Greek term Ethiopian did not apply to Negroes, but was used to describe reddish skinned people close, closely related to the Egyptians who, quote, belonged to the Caucasian race, end quote. So, they did everything they could to try to explain away this African greatness, okay? Now, ancient Egypt is the uh, first major civilization in Africa for which records are abundant. It was not, however, Africa's first kingdom. A May 1st, 1979 New York Times front page article written by journalist Boyce Rensberger reported, quote, evidence of the oldest recognizable monarchy in human history preceding the rise of the earliest Egyptian kings by several generations has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia, okay? So we take you through our history. We look at these different African kingdoms and civilizations. We look at the Punic Wars and Hannibal Barca, um, who was Carthaginian, who was black African, one of the greatest military strategists in history. We look at the Battle of Kanai in 216 BC. We look at Hannibal fighting uh, against the uh, fighting against the Romans. And we look, look at Carthage, which existed from 813 BCE to 146 BCE. We know Rome is going to destroy uh, uh, Carthage. Um, and what's interesting is that Historically, uh, Hannibal Barker was portrayed as 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 an African, portrayed as a black African. There was no question in his book, World's Great Men of Color, Volume One. History scholar J. A. Rogers asserts, quote, the Carthaginians were descendants 
other Phoenicians. The Carthaginians were descendants of the Phoenicians, a Negroid people, and that, in fact, until the rise of the doctrine of white superiority, Hannibal Barker was traditionally known as a black man, end quote. Today, many encyclopedias classify the Carthaginians as whites or Semites, but ancient Greek and Roman eyewitness accounts paint a different picture. The indigenous peoples of Carthage were called the Afers, A-F-E-R-S. The indigenous people of Carthage were called the Afers. Ancient Roman poet Virgil in his poem Mortem speaks of a woman from the Afer or Afar or Afra race, and he says of her, and all her figure proves her native land. Her hair was curly, thick her lips, and dark her color, end quote, okay? Um, in, in Library of History book 20, Greek historian Diodorus mentions a Greek lieutenant named Agathocles, who defeated a people in the area of present-day Tunisia who were the same hue as Ethiopians. Okay, so Carthage is in the area where present-day Tunisia is in North Africa. Now, the eyewitness accounts are corroborated by physical anthropology. L. Berthelon and E. Chantre, uh, both well-noted French anthropologists, noted their examination of skeletons throughout North Africa in all periods. They note that the remains of both upper and lower class individuals of ancient North Africa were representative of the quote unquote Negroid, Negroid race, representative of the Negroid race. OK, so we go through and we look at uh, these these different uh, civilizations and different kingdoms. We look at the Olmec heads and the uh, Olmec civilization as well, um, which uh, has a African foundation. Also, it's a mixture of uh, the Mandinka ancient Egyptians and Native Americans, okay? And Dr. David M. Hotep deals with this in the First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, uh, page 82 uh, also. Uh, and, and we go through, look at these different uh, archeological discoveries, okay? Uh, before, way before Columbus, ancient Malayans uh, from Mali sailed to the Americas in 1311 AD, common era. Face-to-faceafrica.com has this article from uh, December 5th, uh, 2018. It talks about Abu Bakari II, who uh, sails with about 2,000 ships uh, uh, to the Americas, okay? And we know that um, Emperor uh, Mansa Musa is, uh, we know Mansa Musa is gonna become emperor in 1312 uh, AD after uh, Abu Bakari II, okay? Mansa Musa became ruler of the Mali Empire in 1312 AD taking or common era taking the throne after his predecessor Abubakar II or Abubakar II for whom he had served as deputy went missing on a voyage he took by sea to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. Mansa Musa's rule came at a time when European nations were struggling due to raging civil wars and a lack of resources. During that period the Mali Empire flourished thanks to ample natural resources like gold and salt. Now, this is an interesting article from History.com. History.com is the official website of the History Channel, okay? And History.com uh, uh, tells you that West Africa was flourishing at a time when Europe was uh, in the Dark Ages or trying to come out of the Dark Ages and dealing with raging civil wars, famine, you know, the Black Death, the bubonic plague, of the bubonic plague hits in 1347 in spurts and uh 1347 to 1400 europe loses between one quarter to one third of their population okay so this relates to the film black panther and t'challa who is the richest man in the marvel comic universe and this article relates to t'challa to mansa musa mansa musa was the richest man in history he just so happened to be an african man we deal with the uh, uh, film Black Panther uh, as well uh, in, in the class, uh, the first Black Panther movie and the second Black Panther movie also. Um, and we know that uh, the Panther deity Bast from uh, Black Panther comes from Bastet, who was a uh, goddess worshipped in ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Um, 
Bastet was an ancient Egyptian goddess or a netter, uh, worshipped in the form of a lioness and later in the form of a cat with the head of a cat, the body of a woman, the head of a cat. She was a netter or goddess of warfare in Lower Kemet. Uh, she was worshipped as early as the Second Dynasty, around 2890 BCE, before the Common Era. Uh, we know the Wakandan salute, which is always right over left, the Wakanda salute with the cross arms across the chest. That comes from the position of the Nasubitis or the pharaohs uh, in the sarcophagi um, when, you know, they are deceased. It's a symbol of power and royalty. And we see that symbol go around the world. Africans take this around the world. We deal with what the word Wakanda means because Wakanda is a real word. The film Black Panther is so powerful. I've done numerous lectures on the film Black Panther. I did three months of research, uh, researching the 52 year history of the Black Panther comic book uh, uh, and, and researching the movie as well to be able to do my lectures uh, on the film Black Panther. Well, so Wakanda is a real word. Uh, it's an Omaha Ponca and Sioux Indian uh, uh, word. And we also find Wakanda in Bantu languages, like in, in, in uh, Key Congo. Uh, but Wakanda basically basically means possesses secret powers, possesses secret powers. And Ruth Carter, who was the costume designer for uh, Black Panther, and she won Oscars uh, for the first Black Panther movie and the second one. She studied 11 different African cultures for six months and infused this into uh the black panther comic book okay so uh we go through and we look at that african influence that we see in the film black panther as well uh we look at uh the influence from africa that we see here in the land we call the united states of america did you know that the washington monument is an ancient african symbol uh called a tekken which comes from the uh, mythology of asar or set in heru who the greeks called osiris isis and horus and uh, it's a symbol of resurrection and transformation, okay? And there are about 1,200 Tekkenu all throughout ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Today, there are less than a dozen, all right? Be sure to uh, visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, and register for this 12-week online course that I teach, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Kim is one of the original names for Egypt. OK, this class is on when you scroll down our website and you go to the top, uh, you see the information for our radio show, the African History Network show. Our social media handles are here as well. I'm on Sundays, 9 p.m., 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. And we broadcast on our Facebook and YouTube channels. Uh, in pages when we're on live, but our 12 week online course, Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Our next class is Saturday, July 29, 2023. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. This class is on sale $80, regularly $130. Even after the course is over, if you can go back and watch the, the uh, full class, you still have full access. So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. OK, you can use this information with your children. I would say the content is PG-13. Uh, it's not overly graphic. I don't do a lot of cursing or anything like that. I do a, a PowerPoint presentation. We have over 200 slides. I, I created the PowerPoint presentation. I'm a historian. I've been studying 30 years, actually 31 years. Uh, there are about 80 to 100 articles that we reference, uh, the video clips that we look at as well, and uh, book references also. We show you the book references on the screen. You don't have to buy any of these books um, to follow along in class. Uh, this uh, this was an excellent article here from FaceToFaceAfrica.com that dealt with um, tech and new that were taken from uh, Egypt and taken into London, uh, London, England, Paris, France, and New York City, okay? Ancient Egyptians called obelisks Tekkenu, and they were also used to tell time in the past, okay? Uh, cl currently, Cleopatra's Needle is the name uh, given to three ancient Egyptian obelisks, one in New York City, one in London, England, and one in Paris, France. Read this article here from facetofaceafrica.com, Cleopatra's Needle, how three ancient Egyptian obelisks ended up in New York City, London, and Paris, okay? And they, uh, the Tekken or the obelisk 
comes from the mythology of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. There are approximately 1,200 Tekkenu built in ancient Kemet, uh, but only about a dozen are found today. Many of the Tekkenu removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New York, New York, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The Tekkenu are now called obelisk by their new owners, and few people know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king Asar, okay, who the Greeks called Osiris. Uh, in Egypt on the Potomac by uh, one of my friends, Tony Browder, he deals with this information. We also deal with Freemasonry and the origins of Freemasonry because the foundation of Freemasonry comes from the teachings in ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. The word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Uh, Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So the concept of going to an institution of higher learning and getting your credentials in, uh, uh, in uh, a series of degrees, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, et cetera, that concept comes out of ancient Africa, the Nile Valley region of Africa. The concept of the liberal arts and George G.M. James and Stolen Legacy deals with the several liberal arts. And he talks about the trivium and the quadrivium, all of that. That comes out of ancient Africa. Tony Browder deals with this on pages 18 and 32 of uh, Egypt on the Potomac. Now, Masonic temples are considered houses of light or temples of learning. The term Mason or child of light is a direct reference to the highest degree of the ancient Kemetic or ancient Egyptian education system. The 33 degrees of instruction within Freemasonry represent a fraction of the 360 degrees of instruction that comprise the ancient Kemetic system of education. Yet with less than 10% of the wisdom of ancient Kemet, Freemasons have held positions of influence and power throughout the world for over 200 years. So this is also from uh, Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder, which is one of the books uh, that we use in the class. So we take you throughout history. We look at things like why is Christmas celebrated on December 25th? Now, some of this information may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard it before, disagree with it uh, or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what we're talking about. Because nowhere in the biblical text does it state that Yeshua or Jesus the Christ was born on December 25th. And this deals with astronomy, okay, uh, and deals with the winter solstice. We look at things like uh, Black Pete, Joao de Piet, who was a Moor and who was the sidekick to uh, center class and, and who's worshipped in, in, in Holland and in uh in and in the netherlands and in early november each year they have this celebration and this parade of center class coming into uh coming from spain into the netherlands with black people and they have white people who dress up in black face and put on afro wigs who are said to be this african more black pete joata piet okay uh, we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who go from uh, North Africa, go from Morocco right into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal. They're going to conquer the southern portion of Spain and settle there. They call it Al Andalus. OK, and then they're going to go all throughout Europe as well. And to various extents, Africanize Europe. Uh, who were the Moors? So the Moors ancestors were known as the Garamantes. These were a black African people living throughout North Africa. Hannibal Barker was Garamante as well as St. Augustine. George G.M. James in the book Stolen Legacy uh, said that the Moors were the uh, custodians of the ancient Egyptian mystery system. 
So we go through and look at the Moors and their influence in Europe throughout history. We look at things like St. Maurice, who became a patron saint to Germany as well. We look at sources from Renoko Rashidi and Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay. One of the books we use is Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. We know uh, 711 AD, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad. Uh, uh, goes in uh, into the Iberian Peninsula and, and is going to uh, conquer. They defeat the Vandals and the Visigoths, the Vandals and the Visigoths. And this is tied to the fall of the western portion of the Roman Empire in 476 AD that gets crushed by the by those barbarians, the Vandals and the Visigoths. We look at things like why are there Moors heads on these national flags from Corsica and Sardinia? OK, Corsica is a French island in the Mediterranean. Sardinia, Sardinia is an Italian island in the Mediterranean. So we go through, look at this history chronologically. We, we um, look at the three great West African kingdoms, Ghana, Songhai and Mali. One of the books we use is Classical Africa by my friend, Dr. Malefic Ketia Asante, who I just interviewed back in, I think it was April of 2023, dealing with uh, Queen Cleopatra the Seventh and the documentary series from Jada Pinkett Smith, uh, African Queens, and one in the second installment dealt with Queen Cleopatra the Seventh. We also look at Queen Nzinga, which was dealt with in the first installment of African Queens, which is uh, streaming on Netflix right now. Uh, and then also we have to study Christopher Columbus. Columbus is crucial to understanding the transatlantic slave trade and the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, Columbus helps to lay the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, uh, the exploitation of indigenous people. And uh, on his four voyages, Columbus never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is uh, about 90 miles away. Now, African slaves, when we look at slavery coming to the New World, or it was new to Europeans, Africans uh, were brought first to the New World shortly after its discovery or uncovery by Christopher Columbus. Legend has it that one African slave was included in his original crew and they could be found on the island of Hispaniola, uh, uh, the site of present day Haiti as early as 1501. And he, and he lands in uh, Hispaniola December 6, 1492. Upon his arrival in the Bahamas, Columbus himself captured seven of the natives of, uh, for their quote unquote education, he said, on his return to Spain. However, the slave trade proper only began in 1518 when the first black cargo direct from Africa landed in the West Indies. So this is based upon uh, the Asiento de Negros of uh, August 1518 signed by King Charles V, okay, which drastically expands the transatlantic slave trade. Now the importation of Africans uh, to be enslaved to work in the Americas was the inspiration of the Spanish Bishop Bartolomeu de las Casas, who traveled on some of Columbus's voyages. And his support for uh, African slavery was motivated by humanitarian concerns. He, he later quickly reversed course and said that that was wrong and he worked the rest of his life to abolish slavery, but it was pretty much too late by then. He said that the Native Americans have suffered enough and that they need to try to save their souls, but to enslave African people. He argued that the enslavement of Africans and even some whites, proving that in the early period, slavery did not operate according to exclusive racial demarcations, would save the indigenous Amer American Indian populations, which were not only dying out by engaging, were not only dying out, but engaging in large scale resistance, as they opposed their excess, excessively harsh conditions. As a result, King Charles V, then King of Spain, agreed to the Asiento de Negros, or slave trading license, which he signed in August of 1518, which later represented the most coveted prize in European wars, as it gave to those who possessed it a monopoly in slave trafficking, okay? So we take you through our history and, and look at this. We look at some of the skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. There are at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had uh, in this country. And the book by James Newton and Ronald Lewis, The Other Slaves, Mechanics, Artisans, and Craftsmen, which came out in 1978, documents this. There are also studies that show how studying African history improves the academics of our children. Uh, there was an article from the root.com new studies, uh, find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. This is from January 10th, uh, 2018. Uh, 
uh, and then there was a, a, a study, uh, black teens with racial pride do better in school. Uh, this was a study from uh, the University of Pittsburgh and Harvard University uh, that shows that when parents use racial socialization, such as talking to their children or engaging in activities that promote feelings of racial knowledge, pride, and connection, it offsets racial discrimination's potentially negative impact on students' academic development. So there's evidence showing how uh, our children studying their history and knowing their history and having positive self-esteem because of their history, how this improves their academic performance also. So register for this 12-week online course that I teach. Uh, as soon as you register, there's content that you can start watching right now. It's at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, I teach the class. You've seen some of my videos, most likely. Follow us on our Facebook fan page fan page, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Join us in our next class, Saturday, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The full course is on sale, uh, $80, regularly $130 right now. You never look at history the same way. Remember, right knowledge corrects wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever.